He's going to be addressing the high priorities for implementation science research questions in countries with heterosexually driven generalized epidemics. Uh, Kevin is the director of the global, uh, the director of the Center for Global Health at CDC in Atlanta. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacques and Julio and colleagues. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, my title is High Priority Implementation Science Research Questions. Um, but I'm going to talk fairly broadly, uh, some of it linking, I think, to Renee's comments. Uh, really, what I think we're talking about, what I'm talking about, is public health research for decision making and implementation for HIV prevention uh, in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, Stephen Lewis yesterday gave 10 comments. I, I want to give my six main themes from mm -hmm. the uh, presentation that I will race through in a minute, but let me just give the six major sort of uh, points I want to get across. Firstly, we're talking about science, but it's not just about the science. And we cannot escape the need for judgment, uh, just as in clinical medicine, judgment, especially about what kind of data and how much data we need for decision making. Secondly, for prevention, I think unquestionably, the best quality evidence currently relates to male circumcision. 60% efficacy, 30 to 40% at the population level, a once-only intervention that has sustained prevention impact, no evidence thus far of, of uh, losing efficacy from um, uh, risk compensation. Uh, it's the priority intervention for prevention as we speak, um, particularly in Southern Africa. Thirdly, for tuberculosis, ART is of the same order of importance as the introduction of anti-tuberculous therapy was, but we're using it too late. Fourth, the unifying question, there's one unifying question, I believe, an uh, umbrella question, is really how do we best use ART for, for treatment and for prevention for individual health and the public health at the same time? And under that, there are a number, a series of sub-questions. Fifth, probably the most important in my mind sub-question to address immediately in Africa is when to start antiretroviral therapy for the individual. Because I think that's a very, I think the implications of that if we show that indeed it is better to start immediately uh, upon diagnosis, then I think that changes a lot of the framework for discussion. And finally, sixth, we need a coordination mechanism um, to address that overarching question and the sub-questions, uh, which ha a coordination mechanism and some coordination entity that has to include the big funders uh, which includes uh, not only PEPFAR, the Global Fund, and the various agencies we've already heard about also. Let me race through this. Um, that it's not about the science, I'm just about the science. We seem to think with health problems as with other things that science and technology will always save us. But in the realm of human endeavor, it's, it always comes down to people and our relationships. Words by Jim Curran, who uh, initiated the AIDS response from CDC in the early 80s. PEPFAR, PEPFAR-1 spent uh, over $3 billion on HIV prevention. I think we need to ask, you know, was, has that money been well spent? I think as we think of prevention, this, this uh, pyramid from a paper by Tom Frieden uh, is important, that the, the base of the pyramid, the most important influences on health are actually not medical. They're, they deal with the social determinants of health over the fourth, uh, making the default that people have the, the, making uh, the default the, the healthy choice, fluoride in the water you drink, seatbelt laws, and so on. Third, once only intervention. So you only have to come into contact once with a frail health system, vaccinations, male circumcision. Then the clinical interventions that require the adherence and everything we've talked about. And then the weakest, but important, but the weakest are the, the interventions that depend on behavior change. Um, our evidence base is pretty thin. I think Kate referred to this last night in a different way. Only seven out of 40 randomized trials that had HIV incidence as an endpoint showed a protective efficacy, three of them relating to circumcision. Uh, the STI data, I don't think, are generalizable. One out of three pre-exposure prophylaxis studies, one out of 12 microbicide studies. Uh, the vaccine study undoubtedly was important, but we're nowhere near having a vaccine for use. I think the evidence base for pre-exposure prophylaxis is actually very strong. The, the, the experience with these two interventions, of course, is that it's all about 
using ARTs for prevention, it's the fact that one is topical and the other oral is, is, is an important uh, detail, but it is, uh, it's all the same concept. The animal data for pre-exposure, for both actually, is very strong. Um, and um, of course, everybody's familiar with the, the Caprice study that, that really was a very important uh, proof of two concepts. One, that a vaginal product could be delivered and be efficacious, and two, that, uh, th that antiretroviral-based prevention actually works in humans. Similarly, the IPREX study, I think both of these immensely important. Now, how do we actually interpret the FEMPREP study? Um, is this a challenge to the concept, or is this negative result a reflection of bias, confounding, or chance? Um, or is it actually you know, causal and a challenge to the concept? I believe, in my opinion, it's not a challenge to the concept because the, the other data that we have are so, um, so strong. Um, but uh, there are many things to look at, whether it's related uh, to uh, adherence, uh, drug interactions, interactions of the drug with uh, female hormones, inadequate drug at the uh, important uh, site, uh, etc. Uh, very important questions. But I mean, I think a conclusion is that we don't have data, uh, we don't have evidence to use oral pre-exposure prophylaxis in women uh, as we speak. And that's important because if I won't go through this list of similarities and differences between uh, the, uh, the, the two positive trials, but one of the important things is that, of course, as far as oral prophylaxis is concerned, the drugs are available now. I mean, somebody can go out and get them. Uh, we don't have a, a vaginal product. Um, so I think that's that, the, the, that interpretation that we currently cannot uh, advocate use of uh, pre -ex oral pre-exposure prophylaxis in women is, I think, an important conclusion of, uh, of the, the, the recent uh, data. So what now? What, what are the research? What does it take to bring uh, any of these interventions to public health use? What are the implications? Uh, I guess one question is what are the target populations for pre-exposure prophylaxis or microbicides? Uh, discordant relationships, adolescent girls and young women, you know, interestingly, uh, paradoxically, actually left out in the, uh, in the prevention trials. Uh, and people with frequent uh, partner change. Um, getting to licensure, several people have, uh, have uh, defined that. Uh, I think we do need, I think it's risky to base everything on one trial. Uh, so I think we do need uh, confirmatory trials, my own opinion. Um, uh, licensure by uh, regulatory bodies, uh, then uh, definition of policy by the international normative agencies, um, by and from the funding agencies, development of guidelines, uh, rollout and phase four type uh, studies. I mean, that's, I think, the pathway. And I think the male circumcision experience um, was actually a very important and very, um, very successful one. I think uh, Stephen's comments last night about how long it took us was somewhat unfair. I think once the trial data were in, it could not possibly have gone any quicker. And I think it was a Kate was involved with that. I was involved from Geneva. I, it was a remarkable uh, privilege to be, to, to be able to participate in all of that. I guess the only criticism, if, if, if there be criticism, the only question we could ask is should those trials have been done earlier? Because by the time you had 40 observational studies, you sort of say, you know, it took me about 30, I think, to, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, you know, to accept this was likely to be, to be real. Um, I, I think it was a different climate, and I think you know people just said it was an atmosphere of you can't be serious, you're not really going to do this. Um, and in a way, we're in the same situation, I think, with uh, with uh, test and treat. And I think I think opinion is shifting that well, yeah, we are going to do this. Um, but I think all of that, you know, it's e it, some of that is uh, is hindsight. Um, um, Waffer pointed out that actually the first data on the uh, efficacy of treatment for prevention go back to the early 90s with uh, single dose cytobutene. And we now have a lot of observational evidence um, that in discordant couples, treatment uh, is prevention. And of course, we have the PMTCT experience. So my question is about ART as HIV prevention, particularly in discordant couples, is my question is, do, do we actually need data from randomized trials? I would argue we don't. I mean, I'm persuaded that this works, but I think that kind of um, question merits discussion. Uh, Nikos showed this uh, slide last night. Uh, all of the trials, um, one, two, three, four at the bottom, are randomized control trial data. 
the 80% efficacy of condoms is an estimation from the, w the estimate that WHO usually uses, and then you have the observational data from the, um, the, the study pu by Donnell published in the Lancet last year. So in my own opinion, I think we have enough data for public health decision making on that particular issue, at least in discordant couples, but I'd be interested to hear what people say. I think one of the interesting things coming out of this whole discussion, uh, this slide, by the way, an alternative title is Let Us Now Praise Famous White Men. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think one of, the things, um, one of the things coming out of this whole discussion uh, is how HIV is being pulled back into the mainstream of infectious disease epidemiology and approaches. And if we're talking about syphilis, it's about you know, identifying the uh, infected individual and, and, and treating the infection. And you have to ask whether for HIV, uh, you know, it's not all about viral load in its different facets uh, in terms of disease progression, in terms of protecting yourself against somebody else's viral load through a microbicide or prophylaxis, uh, suppressing viral load for transmission, and of course viral load at the population level. Uh, viral load unquestionably the most important risk factor for HIV prevention for HIV transmission. Um, I think we're in a mess with HIV treatment. I mean, it is, when you think about it, uh, almost unbelievable that there's over six million people in the world taking antiretroviral drugs, which are not cheap. Uh, and if you ask any physician, uh, you know, when is the right time to start, you will have endless opinion offered, um, but we actually don't know. And I think for medicine, um, which, you know, a profession I love deeply, uh, for medicine, I think that's just an intolerable position to be in, and I, I think it's, it's actually, um, for lack of a better term, I, think, I personally think it's disgraceful that we've allowed this to happen. Um, it's got huge implications, particularly in Africa, not least because of the whole issue of tuberculosis, and I guess we're talking about that more tomorrow. And then the whole discussion that goes from the individual uh, to the uh, population the whole discussion about uh, test and treat. Uh, these are, um, you know, important questions. Um, slightly odd slide, but it's a, I'm, I'm beginning to wrap up. Um, the, <laughs> the, in a way, the, the, the sumo wrestler sort of represents the AIDS epidemic, and, and the little boy pushing uh, is having an impact. I mean, the big man's stomach is, <laughs> is uh, being influenced, but he's not about to fall over. In a way, it sort of symbolizes our our efforts uh, against the AIDS epidemic. Um, the, the reason to mention the, the, the Hadron Collider is, as you know, the CERN, the Nuclear Physics Institute outside of, uh, I talk about physics because in honor of Brian, actually. <laughs> um, the, the CERN, the Nuclear Physics Institute, you know, exists with one sort of major goal in mind, which is to demonstrate or refute the existence of the Higgs boson particle. This is a fundamental uh, issue in nuclear physics, and when that particle is discovered, your lives will be completely changed. You know that. <laughs> but, you know, huge amounts of money have gone into this, and it is a central question. And actually, the nuclear physicists do very well in, in the networks, the, the academic networks that they have. This, to me, the, the similar question in our field is, how do we best use this very precious gift of antiretroviral therapy? Um, I think we're going to have to, I showed Darwin there, because I think we're going to have to adapt how we deal with all of this because uh, just keeping going is not going to be sustainable financially. There is a model for better coordination. I don't think it's worked particularly well, but it is out there, and that's the uh, HIV vaccine enterprise, which tries to bring everybody together uh, uh, you know, in the quest for an HIV vaccine. But I think some sort of coordinating unit, a mechanism, uh, including the big money, uh, is necessary to address this list of sub-questions, I won't go through them all. It includes, though, what we should be doing with pregnant women. And again, my bias with what we know about pregnancy and link, you know, in, for policymakers, pragmatism has got to come into the discussion. What we're doing for, for PMTCT right now remains too complicated. It's not working, it is too complicated. And I personally think we probably have enough data, or uh, certainly to, 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 to quickly implement and evaluate uh, just treating all pregnant women in Africa with triple combination therapy and leaving them on therapy. Um, many will, uh, Julio makes the very important point that you know, it isn't that long till you meet some sort of cre tr internationally acceptable treatment criterion. 
Uh, secondly, many of these women will become pregnant again. It's not good to stop treatment, we know that. It deals with the breastfeeding issue, and it's certainly going to be simpler in terms of uh, lab testing, monitoring, uh, and implementation. Uh, option A from WHO, uh, it's just too complicated. So that's certainly my feeling. Um, the future, and I'm, I'm closing, um, we're not doing well with money. As you know, the Global Fund pledge last year did not meet the hoped for um, amounts, and funding is going to be an issue. And we, we actually cannot keep just doing what we're doing. Um, it, it, I don't think it is sustainable. And there are wolves at the door. I mean, there's other, you know, the, the policymakers uh, have other interests. Uh, the world keeps changing, and we cannot ignore the pandemic of uh, non-communicable diseases, which is beginning to take the front page of the newspapers where AIDS used to be. So the time is now, I think, for better coordination. Uh, address that big question with all those sub-questions. Thank you very much.